um, hi everybody. I'm very happy to present to you on behalf of the program committee, John Todd, the executive director of Quad9. Uh, Quad9 is the privacy preserving worldwide any cast public resolver uh, listening on the IP address 9.9.9.9. And uh, I'm a huge fan of it. I use it at home. We use it at the uh, NL Labs office. And the reason I'm such a, a huge fan is because I used to work on a, a DNS over TLS implementation in a DNS library called GetDNS. And this DNS library is de was developed uh, alongside the development of the standards for DNS over TLS. And um, I also was involved with uh, the development together with uh, people from Synodon, by the way, uh, this product which uses the GetDNS library called Stubby, which is a privacy local stub resolver, which you can install on your system and it would connect DNS over TLS for privacy reasons to a resolver. Only, uh, until three years ago, you had to run your own DNS over TLS resolver. And uh, it was um, uh, during the ITF in uh, Singapore three years ago uh, that uh, Quad9 launched and it immediately launched with uh, DNS over TLS support. So we were really excited. And uh, I think it was really a thing at, uh, at the ITF uh, as well. And uh, the first public resolver, by, as far as I know, that uh, did this, and in doing so, also set a new standard for other public re uh, DNS resolvers to follow. And uh, another reason I'm a fan is a bit of a chauvinistic uh, one, because uh, Quad9 is running uh, on Dutch open source DNS software, the Unbound from NLNet Labs, from my company and uh, PowerDNS and DNS Dist, also from uh, PowerDNS. And Quad9 does all this as a not for profit organization so they ca can have safeguarding privacy as their prime objective instead of you know, commercial objectives such as uh, selling user data. And despite being a not for profit and having serious commercial competition, uh, Quad9 is one of the most uh, popular public resolvers in the world. Uh, how? I think uh, John is going to uh, explain to us tonight uh, how that's okay. possible. Great. Thank so, you for the introduction. Yeah. Take it away, John. The floor All right. Is Let me share my screen here. Screen. Let's, let's, okay. This is new for Firefox. So hopefully we're all going to, this is going to work. Oh, no. Screen two. Wow. All right. So we should see, hopefully, my slides. Is that correct? Oh. It's, it's popping it's, up. I have a rotating arrow like it's buffering something. Yeah. yeah. yeah there it is. OK, great. Uh, All right. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is actually kind of um, an interesting experiment in a talk, which is I'm going to talk about what we don't do as a, uh, a guideline to what we do actually, or what, what things we do actually perform. So the title of this is a little bit confusing. Sorry about the English um, word salad here. But what we said we were, what I said I'm going to talk about is designing for as little as possible for as much as possible, meaning that we're going to talk about how we design for as little work uh, to deliver as much service as we can. So um, this talk is for it's a reasonably broad audience. Um, it's not as technical uh, in, in a lot of the details in the slides, but I understand that, um, uh, and I will probably go into some more technical detail in the discussion components, and I welcome questions at the end that really do get into the, into the very, very technical components. I'm happy to answer those. But um, this is for people who are running um, 
um, uh, DNS architectures inside of ISPs um, or other large organizations such as educational government um, or any other large network operator. Um, it's for people who are interested in the policy components of the DNS currently and our decisions as to how they relate to policy. Um, it's for privacy um, advocates, you know, how can we do what we do while still maintaining privacy and uh, the security services that we offer. Um, so a quick um, summary uh, that, that I think is already, some of which has already been gone over, but uh, about Quad9. We are a global recursive resolver, um, three years old, actually about four years old. We, we actually were in operation for about a year before coming out of beta in November 2017. We have a variety of different um, services. Um, that we offer as far as DNS recursives go. Um, we offer our security enhanced service, which has a blocking capability. That's the commonly known IP addresses of 9.9.9.9 and others. But we also offer a plain vanilla service, which has no security services on it for those who want to get something that's um, uh, less secure, but potentially is able to resolve more things. We're a not-for-profit. We are a standalone organization based in the United States. Uh, in the United States, the registration of a company that is not-for-profit is called a 501c3. Um, that means that we have no owners uh, classified uh, the, essentially as the public is the owner of the company. We do have a board of directors we report to, but there is no profit, meaning there is no money that is taken out and presented to shareholders or to anybody else. Um, so Quad9 was developed, um, of course, for security as a large concept, but also um, it was also com co uh, constructed as a proof of concept that we could develop a privacy intensive service in, uh, in opposition to many of the um, for-profit or privacy invasive services that um, were developed uh, by others at that point in time, and, and in fact, are still is still the case. Um, we uh, were mostly co-located on IX infrastructure. I'll co go into a little bit of that in a minute with Packet Clearinghouse. That it, Packet Clearinghouse is another not-for-profit organization based in the United States. Um, I actually used to work for Packet Clearinghouse, and then uh, Quad9 was essentially spun out of that organization as its own standalone. Um, we have founding members, meaning the organizations that came together to form and fund Quad9 initially were um, uh, Global Cyber Alliance, or GCA. Um, they had a, a motive to provide security to as many people as they could for as low a price as possible. Um, DNS block list was the method that they determined was the best way to do that. Packet Clearinghouse, which is a, they operate authoritative name service for about 110 of the world's country code TLDs, CC TLDs. And um, I, they also operate the infrastructure on which two of the 13 root name servers uh, operate. So D and E root are also significantly housed at PCH. And then IBM. IBM was actually a very convenient timing. Um, they wanted to do something um, publicly facing, public service oriented. Um, they had nine slash eight, so they have one 256th of the IPv4 space. We approached them with almost perfect timing within about a week. Um, we, we managed to be able to convince them to give us, actually to donate 9.9.9.0 slash 24 to the project. And as part of that, um, they got very excited about how they could help the internet in general. So they are one of our partners for both funding as well as for our threat intelligence lists. Um, the mission is provide basic security services um, with high privacy guarantees. Um, uh, it's free for everyone. There is no payment required to utilize any of Quad9 services, no matter what the scale uh, meaning that we are an individual user or, in fact, an entire country uh, or uh, companies can use it without any charge at all. Um, our mission is also to deploy uh, to underserved markets. Um, and this is, again, in coordination with our not-for-profit um, goals. Um, as an example, uh, we, we deploy to um, uh, Africa extensively um, and to other places in the world where internet infrastructure is weak and internet security infrastructure in particular is very weak. Um, so in some places in uh, where we deploy, very often we are the only security service that the end user has at all. They, they don't have antivirus or enterprise managed or educationally managed um, intrusion detection or malware detection just doesn't exist. So Quad9 is often the only model that they've got. 
And lastly, um, we're trying to improve and drive internet standards and industry best practices towards both privacy and security. So the things that we do, uh, we know that we're not going to be the only one doing them for long, like DOT is an example, DNS over TLS. We knew and hoped that we would not be the only provider of that. And in fact, that's true. Other providers have shifted into the encryption market and encryption as a, as a general concept is getting more widely expanded. Not necessarily due only to our efforts, but certainly because of the fact that we do things in a certain way, um, it drives others to do that as well. And we'll talk about that actually in a little bit um, as far as some of the RFCs go. This is a quick map of what we look like. Um, I think this map is current as of November. We're in 89 nations. We're in 150 global Anycast locations. Um, all of those currently are in Packet Clearinghouse, but we have other partners. Uh, in fact, other partners um, uh, very close to where most of you live uh, that hopefully we'll be announcing very shortly um, to expand that footprint um, into additional networks and additional cities. So. The starting challenge, um, when you're a not-for-profit, you've got a number of different constraints. There's no venture capital money. There's no large investor that's trying to get you off the ground because there's no product. There's no profit. So we have to deploy um, our, our mission goals with an extremely limited budget, staff, and limited time. Um, and then we also understood that by doing this, we would probably become quite popular. So this had to scale to uh, tens of millions or hundreds of millions of end users. Um, and so what is the method by which it is possible to do that? In other words, how do you scale with limited staff budget and time? And the, the answer, although it sounds overly simplistic, um, is this. Um, and that is we avoid doing stuff. <laughs> uh, what, whatever we can avoid doing as part of our network and as far as it connects to our, our mission, uh, we don't do it. This is kind of the topic of this talk, the minimalism. Uh, you know, what is it that we can avoid doing and how did we avoid doing certain things with the DNS in particular um, uh, to help us scale and, and get the most out of the limited resources and time and staff that we have? So. Um, what is um, minimalism in the context here? Um, so there are a lot of coordinating, or minimalism uh, with what we've done uh, in some of the, the areas I'll talk about, and I'm gonna talk about three main areas, which is data minimalization, uh, operational minimalization, and organizational minimalization. How do those three areas coordinate with each other, and how is it that we can avoid taking some of this um, the, the larger burdens that commercial organizations do, how can we shed those to continue scaling? So um, we're going to kind of talk about a lot of these different topics here. What do, we, what do we get from users? What do we transmit? Uh, how do we build the network? What do we do from a software development perspective? Um, and how do we get the most out of the uh, funds that we have as an organization? Um, so minimalism is not necessarily intentional. Um, <laughs> it, is, it is forced upon us by the resources that we have. Um, so we work with what we have in these areas, but we don't necessarily like it. Um, we're always looking for additional sponsorship and help. Um, every dollar or every euro that we get um, is much better spent um, than you would see in, I think, a lot of other um, uh, well, certainly better than in a commercial project where you've got someone making money off of it. But we're always interested in additional sponsors for the project. We take both individual sponsors. Um, we've got a donate button on our webpage. I'll pitch that a little bit here. But we also are more interested in organizational sponsors who are interested in helping us with large scale, both uh, capital infusions as well as uh, resource infusions. Um, so if anybody's got ideas on that or if you have some insights, uh, talk to me after the uh, pre presentation. So the first thing I'll go into is data <clears throat> minimalism, meaning the concept of what is it that we do for um, keeping as little data as possible, and then why. It, this guides so many of our other decisions, uh, both as our, as our um, operational minimalism as well as um, product minimization. But it's really data minimizing is the, is the first thing we want to talk about. And so um, part of our mission keys right in here to the GDPR, which again, uh, Quad9 has used the um, uh, the GDPR as the kind of a founding document for what is it that we, how do we treat data and what do we collect or not collect and um, and this really guides the rest of what we what we have as a network. So with a goal of privacy, um, 
it becomes possible to match our data minimization strategy with the construction of the technical requirements. Um, the GDPR gives us good guidance as to what is considered private data. So from that kind of flows downhill all of the other things that we don't store. Uh, the question is, is DNS private data? Um, so for from our perspective, if you have access to the IP address of the query or any other way to correlate the query with a natural person, then, then we say, yes, DNS is private data. So that drives um, kind of the core underlying component of data minimalization, which then drives a lot of the other components. And here it is, and that is, if we don't log the private data, then we don't have to worry about private data. So our answer for managing to work within the scope of the GDPR and anything hopefully that is um, similarly constrictive for data is that we simply don't log the data. We, we, we throw IP addresses away um, the moment we get them or the moment we've answered a query. Now, there are some call outs for that and I'll go into that in a minute, but the, the, the lack of logging eliminates a huge number of things that we would have to worry about that, that would drive the technical requirements. This is very much an intentional minimization strategy. And since we don't have private data, um, we can eliminate a large number of things that are uh, typically associated with it. So um, it allows us to minimize our network design. Our DNS software implementation has to be very generic. It doesn't have to have a lot of extensions. Um, we can eliminate what we transmit between our locations. Um, we, can, uh, we can eliminate any kind of risks for data analysis um, and everything else downstream. Um, so having no private data, having no IP addresses pushes everything else. Now, it also has um, some good consequences, you know, some specific good consequences where we don't have to have data at rest, rest issues. People are very concerned now about data at rest. Are you encrypting it? Um, how do you anonymize data at rest? Um, we simply don't have the data, so we don't have to answer those questions. Um, we can reduce our backend network throughput because we're not transmitting all that information to some central point or central points. Um, and then it also allows us the, the last and most interesting answer, which is it allows us clear and concise answers to regulatory or law enforcement agencies who might come to us and ask us for data. Um, because we state that we don't store anything ahead of time, meaning it's very clearly worded in our privacy policy and other places and in presentations like this, um, to date, Quad9 has received zero uh, formal or informal requests for uh, any user data. We've received none. Because law enforcement and because regulatory agencies know that we don't store anything, and in fact, our network can't store anything, it's just it's not designed for it, um, we, we can say clearly we don't have the data, so don't even ask us. Um, and so we, that allows us to answer questions um, if they come to us very clearly, because we don't store now, nor do we ever have the data that anybody would be interested in. Now, not having private data also has some bad consequences um, that are, um, these would be kind of suicidal things if we were a commercial company. Um, we don't know how many users we have. Um, we can take some guesses as to how many users we have, but we don't actually know because there's no account information, there's no association with queries to end users or even to um, companies or even to universities. Like a, there might be a, uni a university with 20,000 students, but to us that appears to be one or two IP addresses with a lot of queries, and we can't even tell then how many users there are because of the volume of queries might be behind a forwarding cache. Um, and in fact, we don't want to know really how many users are behind any particular IP address. That's not in our interest to discover that. We look at query volume overall and we look at the trends going up, but we're not interested in seeing where um, individual IP addresses are seeing queries uh, happening or the volumes or anything else. Um, so we also lose some ability to, to do any kind of tracking um, for growth. Um, so there, it says there are some negatives here. We can't say, all right, well, we see a huge growth in the educational community. Um, let's start advertising or let's start promoting Quad9 to the educational community because there's traction there. We don't know um, because we don't, again, we don't track that down to the IP level. So it's really difficult for us to tell where our new user growth comes from at any demographic way. We can tell from a ge geographic way, obviously, because we have certain locations in certain spots, so we can tell that. And we can tell from an AS path um, 
mechanism where certain growth is coming from, which may or may not be able to tell us whether it's educational, government, or anything else, or ISP, but it's not particularly focused. So from a, com a company's perspective, if we were doing this on a commercial basis, um, it would be extremely difficult for us to do, and we do lose some, some visibility there. Um, one thing we actually found out, actually, which is interesting, because we don't collect any of this data, we do actually do some mapping on our data sets, meaning that we'll look at BGP um, summaries and say, all right, this slash 16 of address space has, has a certain volume of queries. Now, again, we're not looking at um, we're not looking at the queries themselves. We're looking at aggregate numbers, but even that we discovered um, actually sometimes gets down to too too small a resolution. Some uh, companies that provide IP to um, uh, uh, geolocation mapping, uh, even like a, they'll provide it down to the slash 32. We throw all those away, um, but even a slash 24 or a slash 56 in V6 space might be too specific, um, giving us information about very small clusters of users in ways that we considered too high resolution. So what we do actually then is we actually have written, we pre-parse all of our IP geolocation data um, this is this is going down a technical rabbit hole for a second, but we pre-parse all of our IP geolocation data to fuzz up so that uh, individual networks are actually moved to next largest cities. Um, and I'm actually not entirely sure if it's a 10K population level, but I believe that's the number we used. Um, I didn't look through the, the code to figure it out, but we basically fuzz up so that if a, if a network seems to be in a very small location where there's only a couple hundred users living, or a couple hundred residents living, we will actually move that query set to a larger city so that when we aggregate and we say that there's a certain number of queries from a certain location, it's, um, uh, it's much more low resolution data. Um, this actually has a side benefit of, of reducing the amount of data sets we have to store um, because we're, we're moving that up to a larger city size. So aggregate information becomes an easier data set to store. Again, minimization of what we store is actually a benefit on the technical side. Um, information about end users based on their query patterns is an interesting thing. Uh, encryption, um, specifically DOE, actually increases potentially the number of things that can be tracked about an end user uh, because, of course, DOE has other things in the headers, in the HTTPS header, so or HTTP header inside of the HTTPS. Um, and so, um, again, we've decided to throw all that data out. We don't store any of it. Um, uh, and at this point, we don't we don't track anything about DOE. Of course, DO53 or standard DNS um, has a very minimal set of information included. It's really the IP address uh, uh, is really mo the most you're going to get out of that. So there's not as much to throw away. Um, there's actually a lot of interesting work happening in general on DNS privacy. Um, there's the EDDI, which is the encrypted DNS. Uh, working group, sorry, that's not a working group, an encrypted DNS conference that happens every week. If you have an interest in that, I'd take a look at it. And then also there's a, an RFC that came out recently, RFC 8932, um, that talks about the policies that encrypted DNS providers, or I'm sorry, that DNS providers in general should have uh, for recursive. Um, and um, uh, interestingly enough, um, the, the privacy policy not exactly word for word, but very close to it, uh, for quad nine is included as an appendix on that RFC as a good practice document. We're actually rewriting the privacy policy to match exactly 8932, but we're most of the way there um, already. So again, that's one of the areas where quad nine is trying to, to be useful in that we are building a privacy policy that can be used as a, a demonstration for both ISPs or other uh, DNS providers as a model to, to base theirs on as well. So um, that was data minimization. Let's talk about operational um, minimalism for a second. Um, and this is one I think that's going to be um, uh, uh, near to everyone's heart there, and that is um, open source. Uh, you know, the first rule of software design is don't write your own software. Um, so uh, if someone else has done it better, use theirs. And uh, in almost all cases, um, someone else has done it better. Um, DNS is a technology that's been around for a very long time. There are a number of, of open source solutions for DNS recursive resolvers. And so we've chosen to not just use one of them, we've chosen to use several of them. Um, <clears throat> so we use um, PowerDNS. Um, we use actually both the recursive resolver from PowerDNS as well as their DNS dist load balancing. Uh, and front-end uh, cache solution. We use NLNet Unbound. 
Um, we use ISC's bind software. But also then, of course, in the back end, there are a huge number of open source packages. And this list is very far from complete. Um, but uh, we use, uh, of course, Ubuntu and CentOS. Um, uh, Kafka, Prometheus, and Grafana is where I spend a lot of my day looking at graphs and, and statistics. Um, uh, our entire stack, um, I th think with the exception of the uh, Atlassian suite, which we use for trouble ticketing, um, uh, is, uh, is open source. So all the, all the systems that are deployed in the field uh, that are actually in each location, they're entirely open source. Um, they work exceptionally well. Um, we've had very few problems with um, any of the open source platforms, and we work closely with open source um, developers to both repair bugs, make suggestions as far as what we'd like to see to make things scale better, and also provide just general feedback on how the software is working, um, as we're one of the largest deployments um, that is publicly able to say how things are going. Um, of course, ISPs and mobile carriers, of course, also use that software at similar volumes, but they're much less likely to give feedback or even communicate sometimes with the software developers in the open source world, um, as is unfortunately sometimes the case between commercial and open source um, uh, communications paths. Um, the DNS camel, as, as Bert Hubert calls it, um, is getting quite overloaded. Um, the number of RFCs and the number of words associated with DNS um, uh, specifications is, is very extensive and it's getting worse. And so there really isn't an easy way that we would be able to keep up with that development if it wasn't for open source. So we rely heavily on the open source development community to allow us to keep moving forward. Um, otherwise, it would be impossible for us, even with a large development team internally, to manage that. Um, security is also very important. All of these components um, being open source uh, has a, have a rigorous examination process for security. Um, we've been very pleased with the responses we've received from the DNS specific side of the house for, uh, for, from all of the vendors for different security or postings for um, vulnerabilities. Um, again, that's something that um, is exceptionally well done in the DNS community. Uh, we could not possibly respond with the speed that um, we're getting from our open source partners. We write um, almost no custom code. Um, there are some components that we have written, notably on the telemetry side, um, from uh, that we actually use to collect and um, uh, strip off data uh, from the telemetry packages um, or from the telemetry stream. And so that's where we've written custom code, but it's 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 very minimal. Um, so um, I've talked about how we open source or how we use open source, and uh, you might think that the next actually what happened there? I lost a slide. Hmm. All right. Well, um, so uh, my missing slide, <laughs> which is blank on my page, um, talks about um, how our network actually is. Um, I'll, I'll bring it back to the open source one, but how we actually, from an operational perspective, have used and leveraged other people's networks, uh, meaning that we have not developed our own network for the deployment of Quad9. We actually have utilized other people's networks for that to, um, to get better um, uh, scope. Packet Clearinghouse, who is our partner, had a pre-existing network that already understood AnyCast quite well. They're in, I think, 180 different IXs worldwide. Um, and so we're in 150 locations, so we're, we're, almost, we're almost fully overlapping with Packet Clearinghouse, House, but not entirely. Um, but it seems that using other people's networks, physical networks, is the best way to go. It would be extremely difficult for us to deploy our own platform um, worldwide without um, uh, extreme expense. So we actually have our own hardware that we deploy in most of the, to answer most of the queries on the PCH network. Um, but they already have existing rack space and transit bandwidth and peering set up with thousands of other networks. So we utilize their uh, layer one uh, model to deploy the system. There are plenty of other providers worldwide who understand AnyCast these days. Um, if you operate your own network, uh, you know, uh, operating AnyCast inside of it is also a good idea. But so it, it is possible to deploy a large AnyCast array now um, through a number of different vendors. The trick is doing it well <laughs> um, and understanding the concepts of 
um, communities and, and getting a good partner who has a good community structure is surprisingly different, difficult. Um, tuning those communities and getting it so that your routes or your people are taking the best path to you is actually quite difficult. And um, we've had a good we've had good luck with Packet Clearinghouse um, with that model. Um, so, uh, so I've talked about layer one, meaning the physical components and the and our software. So you'd think that I would talk about you know cloud being essentially using other people's virtualized computing platform, and really that's that isn't the case. Um, we've actually decided to deploy, for the most part, for most of our queries, those are being answered by hardware platforms that we manage directly. And in fact, most of them right now, most of the queries are answered from hardware platforms that we own. This doesn't sound like it makes any sense, um, but actually it sort of does if you do the math at, at any scale. Um, equipment now to be able to answer DNS queries at scale is actually reasonably inexpensive. Um, these aren't particularly CPU bound processes. Um, they are bound by RAM um, and they're bound by uh, being able to make sure that you've got enough resources at any one spot to answer the queries. VMs uh, running in cloud providers um, are not as reliable as running your own source system. So we've chosen to actually, where we can, deploy uh, on bare metal and then move up from that and have VMs stacked on top of it. Um, again, that kind of equipment is becoming relatively inexpensive these days. Um, a, a reasonably well-equipped server that's only probably four years old, three years old, um, is in the $1,500 US range. So 128 gigs, 40 cores, or sorry, 20 cores, 128 gigs. And those work quite well for DNS. And in fact, scaling up further than that doesn't get you a lot more bang for the buck if you look at the dollars per um, rack RU and the dollars per machine. Um, so um, we've actually chosen to run our own. Um, there are some places where we will be partnering with, um, with partners, but again, we will be running, uh, we will be trying to get, and we will get the, those installations um, running on bare metal where we'll build the systems and build any of the VMs on top of that ourselves so that we get better understanding of what's happening with, with um, uh, CPU affinity and other things. Um, the downside of running our own hardware um, is that, of course, slow deployment schedule. Uh, it takes a long time to buy a piece of equipment, configure it, ship it out into the field, and then really the last part of it, which is getting it installed into the rack and, and hooked up, that's the longest uh, component uh, in some cases. Um, and in some places, um, it has just failed outright. Um, there have been a couple of cities where we just weren't able to actually get past that last point. Equipment finally got into the city and it's just getting the tech on the site at the same time um, in a partnership kind of model is extremely difficult. Um, but it has mostly succeeded um, and that is how we're answering most of our queries today. Um, other um, operational minimalizations. So I, the, the, the word actually minimization is actually in the Q name minimization. So that's what I think I need to bring up. Q name minimization means that instead of sending fully constructed or full domain queries all the way out to the roots in certain circumstances, um, we actually are operating in a condition where we're actually stripping off and sending only the parts of the zone to the DNS operators who need to see it. Um, this is good in that it, it improves privacy for end users. There's no leakage of full um, query data to the roots, which don't actually need to see that. Um, there's a slight downside to that in that root operators lose potentially some visibility um, and for their statistics, but uh, I think everyone at this point has agreed that that's not a, that's not a horrible thing. Um, and then also we've participated in some of the DNS flag days, which are um, minimizations of complexity on the software side. This again gets to our, our goal of creating standards and best common practices. Um, DNS flag days uh, strive to work with both the DNS software providers as well as DNS operators such as Quad9 and others to stop making exceptions. Um, DNS has accrued a large number of exceptions where people, uh, software providers, uh, will work around certain broken things in the DNS. Uh, certain people have broken authoritatives, certain people have broken recursives, and everybody tries to manage to come up with some way to work around the flaws that are not RFC compliant, 
uh, of the other person's software, and that starts to add a lot of complexity to everyone's uh, development efforts. So the DNS flag days, in, in general, the goal is to remove those those workarounds and be more strict to the RFCs, and we've participated in that as well. Uh, in fact, I just kicked off a conversation inadvertently the other day about another <laughs> another strict uh, rule um, that we might look at for uh, an upcoming flag day. Hard to say. We have to do some more research on it. Um, so the operational minimis uh, minimization and data minimization then leads to the last category, which is product and organizational minim minimiz minimalism. So what is Quad9, what do we not do? How, what is the story we don't tell people? Um, and this is actually quite important. We don't advertise ourselves as a complete security solution. Um, even though we have security as part of our default, um, DNS feed. We try not to say that we are the solution that will fix everything. We aren't. We're a part of a layered security model. We're one of uh, multiple different things that, that everyone should be running to protect themselves against malware, phishing, command and control botnets, etc. Um, we're not a content policing tool. Um, and that's important because when we talk about security, uh, people ask us, well, okay, do you defend me against uh, you know, as an example, gambling sites, because in my country that's termed as malicious. Well, but that's malicious um, from a legal perspective, but it's not malicious to the end user. And I'll talk about that in a, in a few seconds here about what it is, you know, how we how we consider the DNS useful. But we try and we and we succeed at not being a content policing tool. We never police based on the content. We only police based on the intent uh, of the end user. So we're aligned with the end user instead of aligned with um, uh, some third party that's external to them. Um, we don't have any other products. We're not a CDN. We don't have a marketing arm. Um, we're not selling demographic data. So there's no hidden product line that we have. Um, and that allows us to minimize a large number of things um, because we don't have the data to build that. Uh, here's actually, here's some areas that actually hurt us a little bit in adoption. And that is, um, we're not a customizable filter and we're not a reporting tool. So end users, when they're using Quad9, very often will ask us, well, hey, can I see how many DNS queries I did today? Or can I see how many blocks occurred from Quad9 to my network? And unfortunately, our answer to them is no, we can't tell you that. Um, we don't know because that would imply that we're storing data about you or about your IP address. And we don't offer that as a solution. And in fact, if we did offer it as a solution, it would immediately mean a huge change in how we would have to create the backend components of our network. And that would drive us to be able to do other things which we don't want to be able to do, such as store data about end users. We don't want to be in the position where we can be forced to store data about end users against our will. We want to simply say this, our network doesn't have the ability, so therefore it can't work. To those two ends, though, a customizable filter and a reporting tool, that's actually something that we're, we, we typically hand off to the end user. We flip it back around and say, well, Quad9 itself doesn't provide this, but you could do it. We recommend very often uh, the use of Pi-hole, which some of you may have heard of. Um, Pi-hole, as an example, if you put that at the edge of your network and have all of your clients point to that as a cache or forwarding cache, or forwarding proxy, um, Pi-hole will give you those statistics. And in fact, there are components in Pi-hole right now which look at the block data that Quad9 provides um, and flags that in Pi-hole. So when we block a domain, as an example, um, that's malicious and you try to look it up, we'll give back an NX domain me uh, falsely, meaning that we'll say that we can't look it up. But we will tag that NX domain with a special bit. We'll set the uh, recursion available bit to uh, <laughs> zero or one. Sorry, I don't remember which it is off the top of my head. Um, but we'll essentially, we'll flag the recursion available bit on the NX domain responses that are blocks so that it is possible for you to look at that, uh, looking at a network dump or looking at pie hole to see that that was a blocked event. So we're trying to push the, the questions of customization and reporting back into the user's network um, where we can, because also the questions of policy and local issues, those should be solved by that local network administrator, not by us. We're trying not to move the policy into our jurisdiction. We want to keep it in the local network operator's jurisdiction. Um, so, um, 
we're also not, and this goes with the first point, we're not an antivirus program. Um, we only stop connections to domains. We don't stop connections to URLs. So we can't look any deeper in the URL. So that's sometimes a problem that people complain to us about. But again, we're not the complete security solution. Um, there are other ways you can look deeper into the URL and those should be used. But as an example for IoT devices or uncontrolled devices on your network that you don't have any ability to install antivirus software into, uh, we can at least block the lookups from occurring from those systems connecting to those malicious sites in general. Um, so product minimalization, where do we get, how do we determine all these different um, sites to block? Um, this is actually a, this is a, this would be a big challenge for a company like Quad9. How do we determine what it is we're trying to provide security against? And so we have opted out of that business. Um, so <laughs> we utilize 20 different providers, around 20 different providers right now both open as well as closed source providers where we get block data, domain data from them um, that we embed into our DNS feed. Um, this is a really difficult set of um, analysis to perform. And really you need to have a company and you need to have a set of researchers and algorithms that do this kind of for a living to be able to determine um, how, to, how to do it correctly. Um, so, we didn't look deeply at the blocking data. In fact, we do not look deeply at the blocking data. Our job is not to compare our providers against each other. Um, our job is to relay the information from our providers to the end users through the DNS. Now, we give our providers some information back in the opposite direction. So the, the next question I always get is, well, why do these folks give this to you for free? Because we give them information about those domains in the opposite direction. If a company, let's say IBM, gives us uh, a domain, you know, baddomain.com, we embed it in the DNS feed, uh, and then every time someone goes to a baddomain.com DNS lookup, we will send in near real time a, a, basically a ping back to IBM saying, somebody in this rough geography, you know, someone in London, tried to look up this domain name at this time. Now, we don't give any information about the client IP address, so that privacy is still maintained. But IBM and all of our other providers who consume this data back are very, very interested in the volumes and the ramp rates and the geographic, rough geographic distribution of the threats that they provide us with. So this helps them improve their feed that they give to us. Um, this also, in turn, and we're fine with this, this helps them sell their threat data to their commercial customers. That's, that's their prerogative and we're, we're happy to do that as long as it continues to mean that we get high quality data that they're giving to us. So we tried not to actually get into that business. In fact, we did not get into the business of looking at threats themselves. We rely on our threat intelligence partners, partners to give that to us. And to date, that's been an amazingly productive relationship. We're getting extremely high quality feeds. Um, we're blocking around, 60 million per day events, um, and some days we've gone up to 140 million different malware or phishing sites that we've blocked our end users from connecting to. That number fluctuates significantly based on time of year. Um, the holidays picking up, we're going to see a lot. We're going to see an increase in the number of blocks. Um, COVID actually created a large number of blocks for us when there were initially huge numbers of fraud sites. Um, I expect that the same is going to happen now with vaccine sites. We're going to see a pickup in those. Um, but then also certain campaigns, um, certain malware campaigns pick up that will bump our numbers by many percentage points in a day um, based on whatever that happens to be. So the net of this is that we don't want to be in the threat intelligence business. We want to be in the threat intelligence relay business. And that's worked very, very well from us. From our perspective, we do DNS. We don't do threat analysis. Um, and then... Um, Frankly, uh, the last thing here on the slide is the product minimization for both threat intelligence, filtering, reporting. Most of our users, most of the end users, don't really care like they, about the features. They care about the benefits, but they don't care about the features. DNS is kind of something that disappears into the background. It just always needs to work. And the fact that it's protecting them against certain things is great, but most people don't really care. Um, enterprise operators care. Um, but most other people don't care. So by the fact that we don't have these tools hasn't really cost us a lot of um, user attraction. Um, again, product minimalization, minimalization 
the last thing here, and I talked about this a little bit with Pi-hole, and I kind of maybe went out of order a bit. We don't actually want to answer your queries. We don't want to answer anybody's queries. The fewer queries we answer, the better. That doesn't mean we don't want to operate, but it means that we want to encourage caching forwarders at the edge of organizations. We only want to answer the first query about something who's got a, and hopefully has a long TTL, but this improves a bunch of different things. It improves the ability for us to answer larger scale as we push these things out into the edge, or as we encourage people to push things out into the edge, it means that our central network can be can scale much larger. Instead of taking every single user and bringing them into our network, we want to push that to the edge. I'll talk about Doe in a second and how that isn't really a, that, that model is sort of broken with Doe. Um, but by not getting queries from end users and in fact having them sent to the network operator, the local network operator, that improves user privacy and anonymity. Um, it allows the local network operator to apply policy. Um, there, go away. Whoops, sorry about that. Um, and then uh, it improves latency and performance. Um, having those cached answers locally, of course, you know, if you're one millisecond away from your local cache and you're 10 milliseconds away from quad nine, you've just cut off 90% of your latency because most of your users are gonna be asking for very similar things. Um, it also allows local encryption. Um, we also promote people using things like DNS dist. Um, you know, we're not infallible. Quad9 in some cities, um, sometimes certain IP addresses might be unavailable due to uh, local routing problems. We see this quite frequently where people don't route things correctly to us inside of their ISP. Um, but in some cases, we undergo attacks which may make things slow. Using something like DNS dist inside your network allows you to spread that load or share it based on failures or, or other local network conditions. So again, we don't want to be the answer. We don't want to be the sole DNS provider on the internet. We want to be one of them, and we want to provide good security and privacy. Um, letting users always have an always-on DNS service is very important to us. So we are not um, we're not promoting ourselves as the uh, as the ultimate solution for everything. We understand that um, we are one service of many that people potentially can use. Um, so um, policy minimization is another one. Um, I've talked about this a little bit where we've said because we don't have data, we can avoid entanglements with local policymakers, meaning um, regulatory in, uh, environments that we can say we don't have data, therefore we don't, we're not a target for requests of it. We've also avoided jurisdictions um, where we are compelled to provide logging of personal data. Currently, um, and this, this of course is on a country by country basis, but over the top DNS is currently not, or there hasn't been much case law, and I won't, I'll say not, not none, but there hasn't been much case law that describes over the top DNS as a regulated service. We're not an email platform, so in other words, there's no, there's no data. We are purely metadata, and it's actually, pure, it's actually pretty poor metadata. So um, we've avoided entanglements where some carriers couldn't. Um, as an example, ISPs in some places need to log all data, all metadata about their end users because they are considered a regulated, a regulated entity. Um, Quad9 to date is not a regulated entity because we don't have any of that additional information, nor do we know who our users are, nor can we know who our users are. So again, we've avoided some regulatory entanglement by simply minimizing the number of offerings that we have to something extremely thin. Um, last thing on my minimization uh, here is that we minimize credit. Um, we don't have uh, we don't have a contract. We don't have costs associated with our uh, our service. Most users don't even know they're using Quad Nine, um, and that's the case mostly with most DNS. But we don't want credit for what we do. Um, at, at least at the end user's perspective. There's, there's a saying in English that's, that says, there's no limit to what can be accomplished if it doesn't matter who gets the credit. And I'm sure that's in multiple languages as well. And, and I, ironically, there are at least three people who are credited with making that statement as the first person. Um, so it, it's true and even uh, self-referentially. Um, but this is our most important minimization strategy in that we want to provide protection and privacy without people even needing to know we exist. 
Um, and we hope that that model extends not just for our own service, but then extends to other um, DNS providers, internet service providers, et cetera, that they will provide these same protections, both security protections as well as privacy protections, um, using us as a template. Um, so thanks for listening to me talk about the things we didn't do. Um, I want to talk one more quickly about something that we believe is important, um, and that is DNS filtering um, and how we apply it. So this is an important f model here that most people don't get, and that is DNS filter filtering is an ineffective censorship tool when imposed on the unwilling. People who want to get to some site um, and who find that DNS doesn't work for them, they will find a way around it. So you have to look at the motivations of the end user. This is why we don't censor. This is why we're strongly opposed to using DNS as a censorship medium. Um, it is actually used as censorship in many nations currently. Um, it is both effective and probably counter, uh, counter to the goals of whoever it is that's trying to impose those rules. It, it forces people underground. Um, DNS is extremely effective as a security tool for people who want it, uh, where you basically have cooperative um, implementation between the network operator and the end user. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm not sure how this fits into my talk completely, but DOE is one of the things that we're worried about, um, kind of breaks some of these models. Um, and that's a very long story about DOE. And, you know, we actually offer DNS over HTTPS as a service. Um, we're not uh, particularly enamored of DNS over HTTPS because it creates conditions that make the user and the network operator um, it puts them in opposition to each other. And that's not something we believe is a long-term strategy that is effective um, uh, and, and may in fact have unintended consequences to the opposite goals of those who want to remain private. Um, so, um, and I can probably answer more about that as we go along uh, in the question session. I know I'm, at, I'm about 45 minutes here. Um, I've got um, some main points here, and that is um, avoid doing things. Avoid doing stuff if you're deploying a privacy or security-based um, uh, service that's DNS-oriented. Um, here are all the things to not do. <laughs> um, and uh, if you're running a DNS service or if you're running an enterprise uh, edge resolver, you know, don't log things, don't write your own software, leverage other people's work, leverage other people's networks. Leverage other people's hardware that's used, even, um, if you're looking to do this inexpensively. Um, don't try to make things uh, too complicated. Uh, use other people's threat lists if you can get them, if you want to implement them on your own. So here's a bonus slide I threw in, and I'll only talk for another minute here. Here's where we failed. Um, here's where minimization didn't work for us. Um, because I think it's important to call out where things don't work as well as where they do. Um, Mobile devices make things really difficult. Uh, inserting um, a DNS, a different DNS resolver into mobile devices has traditionally been extremely difficult. So we, we had for Android as an example, we had to write an app that does that. And that when you write an app, then you start to add other things into the app and it starts to become more complex. Um, so the app is an example that we offer has, um, it actually detects when a block occurs and it has pop-up windows and it has all these other things. Good features, don't get me wrong, but minimization of minimization did not occur there. Um, in fact, we keep looking at how do we add features into the mobile app to make it more useful. Um, that is an area where we had to become um, less minimalistic. Um, marketing, um, minimization is not a good strategy for marketing. Um, word of mouth works very well, but we probably would do well if we were having uh, a much better and more aggressive marketing strategy that, of course, then becomes more complicated. Um, the DNS resolution stack, we, I said earlier that we implemented all, or not all, we implemented three of the different um, DNS recursive resolvers, so unbound, powered DNS, and um, bind. And we found that if we only implemented one, that put us at a significant risk for software stack failures, which would create outage situations. So we had to add complexity to the network in order to be able to distribute to those three different packages. And so uh, we now have to keep track of three different software stacks for recursive resolution. Um, this has actually saved us on a number of occasions where a problem with one stack um, isn't reflected in the other, um, or what I'll call not even a problem, but certainly a, a, an interpretation of RFCs is different in one than the other. And because of the fact that we more or less randomly distribute queries, very often we'll get the right answer, 
even though half of our or a third of our stack is not answering um, with a, a desired outcome. Um, we have different flavors of DNS resolution. Um, so 9.9.9.9, it has both security and uh, encryption and everything else on top of it. We had some people who wanted to have no security, so we added 9.9.9.10. By the way, there are secondary IP addresses for all of these, but I won't, in both v4 and v6, but I won't go into all of them. Uh, you can look at our website for those. So 9.9.9.10 has no block list on it, and in fact has also no DNSSEC. Then some people said, well, I'm getting the wrong answers from Quad9. I'm in, I'm in Spain, and I'm getting, when I look up um, example.com, I'm getting a server that's being deployed in the United States. The CDN is giving me a server that's deployed in the United States. All right, so there's something called um, ECS, um, eDNS Client Subnet. Um, it's actually a privacy leak, but some people need that to get the appropriate server. So now we have 9.9.9.11. Um, which has security and ECS, meaning that people consciously have to choose to leak that data. But again, you can see how growing, adding these different services, we're adding bits to the choice model, and this is getting pretty big. Um, and so complexity starts to fail there, where we now have to manage all these different flavors of the service. But again, these are things that people ask for, and we would lose them as users, so we've had to add them. Um, routing is getting very complicated. Um, and, and ma managing community structures is getting challenging. Um, and then DNS standards are getting ridiculously complex, um, including the concepts of encryption. And so that's causing a lot more effort onto our deployment and also into troubleshooting. Uh, it can't be minimalist in that, in that model. You have to offer those different standards, adherence to the standards and encryption. So that ends my talk. I would love to have questions. I've got, I think, Eight minutes. Sorry for talking too long. <laughs> Do I have to give this back? Uh, no, I shouldn't. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you for your time. Just a mute, you can talk. Yeah, thank you, uh, John. I, uh, it was very educational also uh, for me. Even for you. Uh, so, so could you explain a little bit uh, more how the bit uh, DNS over HTTPS, how it, the user uh, is uh, intention or uh, what, how did you put it <laughs> sure to the operator operator right so um dns over https is encryption protocol and we, we actually we're all for encryption that that's that's not to be misinterpreted but the way that dns over https is being implemented creates a condition uh where currently uh, and i'll I'll use, I'll use both an enterprise uh, case and I'll also use a national level case to describe the, the challenge. There are enterprise operators today, many of them, uh, who use DNS as a method to block connections to malicious sites. And that's just like Quad9 does, right? There are, there are people who, who have a DNS server that they operate at their, at their company and they look at different DNS and they use that to block threats. Um, so, so far, so good. But what happens when the browser without even the user's knowledge, and this is an important component, or without the user's active participation, when the browser starts to connect to a DNS resolver that is outside of the enterprise network to resolve domains that then might deliver to that, op to that user malicious content. So now the network operator is considering that a, th a risk. They're saying, well, wait a minute, I, you know, encrypted DNS is a risk to my network because these are still my, my users on my network and I'm responsible for them. But I now no longer have the ability to control to what sites they're connecting, whether that's for what, whatever policy that's associated with is irrelevant. You know, the network operator owns the network and the users on that network have to comply with that policy. It could be for good or it could be for ill. But an enterprise network is the clearest case where the DNS over HTTPS does a couple of things. One is that it moves the DNS transaction now to a distant resolver, like Quad9 even, 
um, instead of being answered locally. So you've got a speed issue, you've got a policy issue, um, and that's a challenge. The network operator at that point will consider DOH as a threat, and but they have no way to block it because it's on port 443 looking like any other HTTPS traffic. And so their response may be either to give up and say, well, I, there's nothing I can do here. <laughs> uh, each user now is, is on their own. Or their response will be something along the lines of, well, since I no longer can control, even at this minimal level, the DNS or my, my basic security model is no longer in control for unmanaged devices. Um, therefore, I will prevent access to the internet and I will create a set of proxies and that the only way you are able to get access to the internet is to force all traffic through the proxy, which unwraps everything, uh, therefore removing privacy even in the most minimal case from end users. Um, that same model can be applied to national level censorship. And that's what's most concerning. We look at countries like China currently, where um, denial of service to entire IP address ranges is, is for, forbidden. Access to things like quad nine is forbidden. If more clever algorithms are developed to hide um, control methods through existing protocols like DOH, then my belief is that we will see those entire protocol methods denied and even more privacy invasive methods applied to user data in order for the network operator to enforce their will upon the end user. So that's the short form. I love DOH as, a, as an encryption protocol. I'm very, very worried about its long-term implications because it creates this, this condition where the end user their goals are opposed to the network operator. Um, the, the DNS provider, this, this, this distant um, system, really is not, has no stake in the game, right? Yeah. I, it's really, you're, you're creating conditions where you're, you're creating a conflict and ultimately the people who own the network or who have the guns are going to win that battle. And I'm worried that, that how that's going to work out for end users. Right, I understand. It's like an arms race, but the countermeasure of things that you didn't want to kind yes. of. Now, now the, the difference with DOH and DOT is very, very small, but it is important. And that is that DOT has its own port number. And if you're a network operator, you could block that port number and in theory, that blocks DOT, and therefore you're going to force your users to go to some other solution that remains that gives them visibility. DOH, in, arguably, in, intentionally um, is embedded in a different protocol, therefore is invisible. So it creates this this fight between the end user and the network operator. Whereas DOT, at least we can say, well, if you want to block DOT, if you want to block this method, block this port. Uh, one thing that worries me, though, you're, you're talking about, you know, operators in China and censorship, but I'm more worried that my uh, smart TV is going to hard code this DNS server address in it, going to connect that to HTTPS and it's going to feed me ads irrespective of my pie hole, whatever measures I put in there. Yes. And I'm, I equally hate HTTPS, but uh, how can we, I mean, apart from blocking its access to the internet, it doesn't make sense because I want to watch Netflix on it. Is there a solution? Um, so Quad9 has tried to be a good network. Um, we've tried to be a partner to the network operators. We, we've said that we will not operate our DOH services on anything other than a well-publicized set of IP addresses. Um, so in other words, 9.9.9, .9 .9, 149, 112, 112, uh, 2620 FE. We've said these are the networks on which we operate Doe. And we will not operate Doe on networks other than these. So if you're a network operator, you can block port 443 to our networks, and you will 
then then that will create a condition where you are blocking dough to quad nine. But of course, then you know every operator who has a dough service would have to be in that IP based block list, and that's impractical. Um, I don't I don't honestly see an easy solution to it. Um, I, I don't, and that's what worries me about dough. Um, it's it's already being used by some malware. If you, I mean, if you Google a bit, look up Doe malware distribution, you'll find that there is malware now using Doe. And you know we have some ability to protect against that if we know what domains we should be blocking. But it, it, it's a it's a weak weak correlation, sadly. So, John, do you think that DAO should be offered uh, everywhere or just by a limited set of providers? Hmm. So, my, I think that the DAO, to use the saying, the cat is out of the bag with DAO. There's no, there's no way of solving this problem universally. I think that provider, local providers should offer a DOE solution on their own network and that there is work currently at the IETF for DOE discovery. So a device, when it, when it gets a DHCP address, how do we bootstrap finding the local network provided DOE server? I think that that's the first step. Then I think the second thing to do is to, to create a best common practice um, for centralized, or I'll, I'll, I won't even say centralized, just over-the-top DNS providers like Quad9, like Google, like Cloudflare. It would be interesting to see potentially a BCP about how we announce or how we declare what endpoints will have DOE operating on them so that network operators could create, as an example, very easy filter lists that prevent connecting to commonly used over-the-top providers. I'm not sure if that's a solution, but it's the it's the one that's come to mind the most, uh, the first. That's the first thing I've thought about. Um, there's a lot more discussion that has to happen here. Discovery, I think, is a big issue. How do devices discover their DOE endpoints? Um, that's yet to be really worked out completely. And that, I think, is the key component. But there'll always be services that just, just ignore that and that, that they go and use whatever DOE server they're going to want to look at. And that's mostly going to be malware. Um, arguably, that malware could have used HTTPS in some different, not a, a protocol other than DOE, it could have used some encrypted port to get its command and control structures. Um, and that DOE is simply making this a formal method. Um, in reality, though, most malware providers are extremely lazy, and they will use whatever the easiest protocol is for them to get their hands on. So. It, this will create conditions where dough is utilized more for bad things. Um, and, but how do we how do we solve that problem? I don't have a clear answer. It's there's a lot more standards that have to happen, and there might not actually be an answer. This might just be another escalation in the um, cat and mouse game of um, malware versus protection that we just have to live with. That might actually be a positive argument for uh, providing easy to use though because if malware developers are lazy they will want to use it because it circumvents the local dns and it will make the pattern to recognize that this is malware easier that's possible yeah i know that um you know we see because so many endpoints use quad nine um we do actually see some patterns in the data in general that show us when malware is happening. And in fact, we've actually discovered um, we've actually discovered things uh, new malware just based on our pattern data, not looking at IP addresses, but just number of queries on certain domains and what their patterns are. So, and we've fed that back to our threat intelligence providers, and they've created they've looked into it further, and they've created blocks that have come back at us. So, yeah, I agree that they'll choose the lazy path, but um, it's a it's an arms race that is. Um, accelerating rapidly. <laughs> so, so uh, John, 
Uh, what I'd like to know, what's your stance on oblivious though? Um, I, it's a, it's an interesting concept. I actually kind of like it because it removes the IP address entirely, but I'm, I'm, I can't say, you know, we will probably participate in oblivious dough as a, as an endpoint. We just have to get to that point. It's a, to some degree, it's a problem or it's a solution looking for a problem though. Um, if you trust your DNS vendor to answer your queries correctly, which you do, no matter who you use, whether it's oblivious to or not, does the IP address of the querying client make that much of a difference? In other words, if you already have this trust relationship where you're saying, all right, quad nine, I trust that you're not gonna give me the wrong answer for this website. Um, does the fact that we see your IP address in the query process, is that, is that that much more data? Um, for Quad9, for users of Quad9, I see it as a limited win, not much of a win. Um, for people who are using commercial providers that they don't trust because they believe that their data is being collected and sold, yeah, it's, it's a win. It's also a performance hit because you're sending, Oblivious Doe is sending your query to one server, which then sends it to a different organization uh, 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 at least if you're going to use Oblivious Doe correctly, you need to send it to a different organization's DNS server, which unwraps that query and does the recursive analysis, then sends the reply back. Um, you're adding quite a bit of latency there. You're also adding a huge amount of, um, how do you, what's the customer service process for that? You know, how do you debug that? Um, that's going to be, that's going to make people's heads explode. I mean, it's difficult enough for us to debug things that come into ours where we have the full visibility of the client and the recursive process. But once it disappears into some other provider's cloud where the DNS resolution actually occurs, I don't, I don't, I think it's a great idea, but I think just like Tor, the number of users will be somewhat limited and in very specific circumstances. I could be wrong. You're muted there. So is that is that a yeah? That's a, that's am, a ambiguous enough. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So yeah, so you have to go along with it with Quad Nine because it's happening. But uh, yeah, it's interesting. Maybe it's it's going to cause confusion. <laughs> So uh, I think from a, I think from a, a troubleshooting standpoint, it's going to be a very difficult problem to solve. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I also thought um, when you, in, in your uh, answer that um, um, the users don't have to trust the uh, DNS resolver if they rely on if they would validate the DNSSEC themselves. Yes. How many domains are DNSSEC signed? Right, right. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm a I'm a big fan of DNSSEC, by the way. But I just uh, the the saying that the problems are going to be solved by DNSSEC is a is a false. That's a falsehood. It's not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here in the Netherlands, the amount of DNSSEC used is actually quite high. Yes, yes, you're one of the highest nations, and I. Uh, that's that's a, that's an excellent excellent figure. That's but, because we are so law abiding, all of us. <laughs> just <laughs> that reason, but yeah. There was a f financial. Uh, actually, I. Uh, yeah, there's a financial. Uh, 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 yeah, incentive to have your uh, domain uh, DataSec uh, signed, and then you get some money off. Uh, and by the way, we, we of course are DNSSEC validating and have been since launch, so that's good. We've seen the number of DNSSEC failures dropping significantly in the last three years. We used to get quite a few. We would have to create what are called uh, NTAs or negative trust anchors, which is basically an, ex it's an exclusion uh, for DNSSEC where some people were so broken that we would, they said they had DNSSEC, but then it never worked, so we'd have to exclude them. That The number of those domains is extremely small now um, I think it's still some U.S. government domains and some 
Canadian government domains and some Brazilian government domains that don't work correctly, but almost almost everything else DNSSEC just works. That's a good sign. That means that DNSSEC signing software is improving too. Yes. Because it's not easy, right, DNSSEC to um, compare to uh, non-DNSSEC. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I didn't know that uh, Quad9 was also doing uh, EDNS client subnet. That, that was new to me. The so, not 11. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we haven't, we haven't really officially made a, a large scale announcement of that yet because there are still there are still challenges with ECS. Um, notably, um, Akamai uh, doesn't accept our ECS because um, that's a very long story. Because we allow because we have so many forwarding um, caches sending data to us, like big ISPs sending data to us, we will allow them to set their own ECS. So because we, we would only ever see the IP address of their of their resolver. So they might have a country of, you know, a large country full of clients. So we allow ISPs to set ECS data towards us. That then means we send th that data to the authoritatives. Um, Akamai's current rules prohibit that. Um, they require that the recursive resolver, meaning Quad9, would overwrite any ECS coming from our customers and insert the IP address of the um, of the of wh whoever it is we see the query coming from. So, in other words, their recursive resolver. Um, we think that that's counter to our. Uh, we don't want to override the rules, the, the wishes of our customers, which is that they want to set their ECS to be whatever their clients are. So. Um, we kind of have a, we, there was a little bit of a stalemate with Akamai and we're working with them so that we can potentially change the way that we, uh, that we deal with ECS to make them happy. So in other words, if you're using ECS, it works for everybody other than Akamai. <laughs> but since Akamai is one of the largest consumers of ECS, we haven't made the announcement yet because we don't want to have people saying, well, you use ECS, but it doesn't work. Okay. It's not our fault that it doesn't work. It's just that they're not accepting it. Right. Yeah, but but um, but how can you tell if it's not if it's not uh, sent if the ECS EDS client subnet is sent by the resolver in, uh, who is sending to Quad9 or sent by Quad9 itself? It's that's it's purely a policy question. Um, okay. So they Akamai knows that we don't do it because they can test right. They can they can use Quad9 and set it to whatever they want. Um, so they have not, they have not whitelisted our IP addresses yet, but I think we have a solution that might work out, but it's, it's, and I won't go into the details cause it's long and drawn out, but I think we have a way that we can create a policy and a technical solution that answers those questions. So we do offer ECS. It does work. Um, but, but don't expect it to work to a hundred percent of destinations. We, we've kind of, you know, ECS is a, is a longer story there. I mean, I'm not a, I'm also not a big fan of ECS because I think it's, it's kind of a, kind of a hack. Um, we have 150 locations. Um, that should be close enough. <laughs> I know it isn't. Um, you know, if you're on an ISP in a, in a certain city, you have your own caches inside your ISP. Um, but the, the use of um, query data to direct clients to content seems to be the wrong place to do it. Um, and I won't, I won't even say it seems to be the wrong place to do it. It is the wrong place to do it. Um, that should be done at the connection layer when you actually create a socket to the origin. Um, the origin should say, oh, I, now I see your IP address and it should redirect you to the closest content through whatever you know higher layer mechanisms you have. But using the metadata to do that, especially when the, the metadata is known to be so inaccurate, um, is it's not a it's not a very good solution in my opinion. But but here we are, right? We've been ECS has been around now for a number of years, both pre-standard and standardized, um, and it's it's here to stay for some time. Um, notably, um, you know, we, we don't like ECS, but we recognize some people asked for it. There are entire providers who aren't doing ECS at all. Um, Cloudflare, as an example, doesn't do ECS ever. 
from, uh, oh, I shouldn't say that. They don't do ECS in general. I think they have some ECS solutions. I can't speak to them, to their network, but I'm pleased to see that people are not as uh, also unhappy with ECS as we are. We don't really, really like it. It also c consumes huge amounts of memory on the recursive resolvers because it, we don't just have to remember one answer now. We have to ha remember that one answer for every single subnet that asks about it. So, yeah, yeah. yeah it's very complex. Yeah, I, I believe Cloudflare uh, also has experimental uh, DNS over TLS uh, relationships with some authoritatives. And they do have this with uh, the authoritative service from Facebook. And I do believe that they do do ECS, that they even have this in a blog post uh, over these uh, DOT uh, relations to Facebook. Right. That, that's that, that kind of, that's, we like to be consistent with how we deal with everyone, um, yeah. meaning the data that we give or do not give out to authoritative providers must be consistent for all quad nine destinations. Um, so that, that type of relationship would make us a little bit nervous because it, um, that has a tendency to expand and become <laughs> much more difficult from a policy and explanation perspective to end users. If you have yeah. to explain it, if you have to explain individual exceptions, um, it, it starts to erode your 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 goals of privacy. Right, right. Okay. So uh, yeah. That is, by the way, um, yeah, what you said about uh, running different uh, DNS softwares for uh, robustness—that's actually how uh, NLNet Labs started. Uh, because the uh, RIPE NCC, they needed a second product next to BIND because of a bug in BIND. Right? <laughs> and they asked uh, an LNET if they could uh, create such a product. And uh, so uh, that's how uh, NSD emerged. So for, for robustness, it's, it's better to have different software because there are different bugs in all the different software. Yep. Oh, yep. and by the way, on your slide, <laughs> One one last comment. It's not an LNET inbound. It's an LNET Labs uh, inbound. Oh, and LNET sorry. And LNET Labs are different organizations. Yeah. Okay. I will repair that. <laughs> okay. So, you know, if anyone else uh, has questions for John, then uh, yes, now would be a good time. What would be the hardest question we could ask? <laughs> what would be the hardest question you could ask? Um, the hardest question that we have to face right now is how do we measure our performance? That's a tough one. With an Anycast service, being able to measure performance becomes an extremely subjective thing. Um, questions like uptime, and and performance from whose perspective um from what you know from what number of users affected by an issue is it geography um is it protocol um the when you get to a network of a certain scale or service of a, of a certain scale the the most difficult questions become those of um measurement and then action based on the measurement and that's the, that's the situation we're in now. Is that how do we how do we measure from as many endpoints as possible um, our performance, and how do we measure changes because we're constantly changing the network, both software-wise as well as routing, um, and that's a real challenge. Um, and so that's something we have to we have to address more. Yeah, uh, maybe I can uh, chime in on uh, here. Uh, by any chance, are your services uh, being uh, monitored actively by either uh, RIPE uh, NCC uh, DNS MON or uh, RIPE NCC uh, RIPE set? Uh, uh, Atlas, I mean? Yes, there is an Atlas test that occurs now once a week. Actually, I don't know if it's been accelerated, Willem. I, I don't know where that stands. Um, but I know that um, there is a set right now that monitors all of, uh, and from all RIPE Atlas probes. Um, does query tests to quad nine. I don't know the, the, I don't know the test number off the top of my head, but I'm sure you can search for 
9.9.9.9. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a very long time ago, but, but I um, used to work on uh, the DMS1 project. And uh, we did in that time list uh, all the uh, TLD and uh, CC uh, TLD all raters. There wasn't such a thing as uh, these uh, any uh, novelty DNS platforms, so to say. But but I think they they should be uh, eligible to be one of two in that uh, in that uh, platform. I would I would very much like any more monitoring than we can get. Um, and I think the important thing is also being able to discuss with the people building the monitors um, what it is they're being what it is they're building. Um, we find some unusual patterns. Um, there are some commercial um, organizations that do resolver monitoring, um, and they typically show quad nine very poorly in their statistics because we don't operate in the same low budget colo shops or VM shops that they do. Um, we operate, almost all of our infrastructure is located at IXs, which is where we think the best connectivity is for um, eyeballs, you know, end users. Whereas a lot of the test points that some of the commercial monitoring systems use are located in VM hosting shops, which is maybe where some of the other open resolvers are located as well. So they have very good statistics, but they may be very distant from the actual end users. So there's a little bit of a skew there. Um, also, looking at just talking about monitoring and failures in monitoring, Quad9 um, does not create, we, we don't actually have our own uh, network announcements. We don't have our own slash 24 networks at each pop. We occupy network space from uh, whoever our local transit provider is. This means, uh, to, to sum this up, it means that when people are looking at statistics worldwide and saying, well, these are the biggest recursive resolvers because we saw requests from this AS to our authoritatives. Um, very often, Quad9 is not counted in those because we appear to be coming from you know, 120 or so different origin ASs that are not, they're not listed as Quad9 because we don't use a full network. We don't waste a whole slash 24 in each pop we use whatever network space we're given. So the size of Quad9 is often, from a monitoring perspective, is often underestimated because it looks just like an ISP or 100, more, 100 or more ISPs resolver addresses because it's not associated with our name in any way. So that's another interesting challenge. But again, uh, getting back to that credit thing, we don't care that we get credit. The, you know, showing up as you know, the world's largest DNS resolver is not our project plan. Um, we're okay as long as we see end users getting, you know, the number of users is increasing or the number of queries is increasing, the number of blocks is increasing. Um, that, that lets us know we're doing the right thing. Still, it would be nice to have a, a fair representation if you are measuring resolvers. So it would, yes. would be nice if you could have uh, publish uh, the list of uh, IP addresses uh, in use. Yeah. We, to date, we haven't published it because, again, they're not our IP addresses, and we're concerned that that may, do, that may create an, an attractive nuisance for someone who wants to try to attack the back-end network that we have. Um, it, it may be the case that we just have to forego that and publish the list. Um, we've been giving out the list to CDN providers and researchers who ask for it or researchers that we think are useful. Um, we've been, I, actually, I send it to them an email, and we have an updated version that we keep uh, sending out every once in a while. So there is a list, um, but it's not publicly accessible. And so sometimes that means the research researchers don't find it um, while they're creating their tools. OK. So no, no more questions, people? No? Okay. Yeah, I think the most uh, difficult uh, question would be, should uh, DNS be a, a platform or a service? <laughs> Both. <laughs> Both. 
you know the the and that's it but that's a good question i mean we 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 encourage people to make it to run their own dns server on their premises because they we want to give them the local policy control visibility latency all these other good things but the 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 heavy lifting work that we do which is security right blending these 20 different uh, security providers handling um the latest um flaws in in dns recursive lookups um, managing encryption, those kind of things. That's actually kind of hard to do. And there are not many organizations are big enough to have somebody who's an expert enough in DNS to provide that. So, and that's that's evident, right? Google now is whatever it is, to, uh, depending on who you listen to or what, what numbers you look at, they made 10, between 10 and 20% of the world's recursive DNS is done through Google because that's just easy. People don't have to think about it. So there's a, there's clearly an issue that people don't want to do their own DNS. Um, so the the service model is one that's that's attractive. Um, so instead of just letting people go to a commercial service provider who's got different um, reasons for doing it, um, we're there as an option to both give them some security and keep privacy. Have you uh, submitted uh, a talk to the May Contain Hackers 2021 event? I have not. Oh, you should consider that. Okay. It will be one of the first events that will take place during the pandemic because we have enough space to keep 20 meters apart for every of the 3,000 visitors. <laughs> Is it being held outside? <laughs> Can you send me yeah. a link to that? Yeah, I will. I'll send it via email uh, to you. Fine. Thank you. OK. Let's go to the informal part of yeah. our meetup. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, uh, John, for your talk. It was uh, very Thanks. very good. And Thanks for inviting me. Good questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.